composite beam design. Okay, so now it's my turn to ask you questions. So what's the difference between a full and non-composite beam? Slip. That's right. It's all about slip. How do you prevent slip? Exactly right. Providing a load path, a way to transfer load from the, from the concrete slab to the steel girder. How do we typically do that? Nelson studs, Nelson studs are, are what we typically use. Okay, so I got a question for you. If you have a non-composite girder, that means no Nelson studs, and you cast concrete right on top of it, what do you think? Do you think you're going to get any bond between that concrete and the steel? Yes. The answer is yes, you will. Um, <clears throat> so you'd say, well, I want to take that into account. That's not a good idea. Okay? Because, and this happens in the field sometimes. It's kind of interesting. They'll, they'll go out to these girders that are, that are non-composite and they'll have their nice, fancy, fun and element models that tell them what they think the answers are. And they'll start loading those girders up and they'll be much stiffer than they thought at first. Much, much stiffer than they thought at first. If this is like a P versus delta type type situation, much stiffer than all of a sudden they drop. Okay. Well, this is where there was bond in between the concrete and the steel, and that bond slips or breaks. Okay. And the scary, scary thing about that is, is that um, you could, it could cause instant failure. Okay. It usually doesn't though. It usually just slips. Okay. Slips and comes back. It's possible if this gets high enough. When it slips, it's it's over, game over. Okay, but it doesn't usually happen. Okay, it usually slips beforehand. But so yeah, there's even in non-composite girders, there's I don't know if there's anything truly non-composite. You will get some friction. Of course, once you slip, you've pretty much lost everything. Okay, and in full composite, we like to say that we provide full composite, but I'm not sure that's true. Okay, um, we provide something really close to full composite. Okay. But that's okay. We don't need to worry ourselves too much about those details. Okay? We're going to teach you how to do full composite designs in this class. So what's the difference between shore and unshored construction? What's the physical difference? What does shore construction mean? You, have, uh, you actually make forms to support the, the middle of the stands so that you don't have large deflection when you're pouring your that's right. They actually have usually made out of wood, typically, or sometimes metal in some cases, pipes, but usually out of wood if it's in a building. Shores that go up, and what's their job? It's to hold the beam, right? Because what are you going to pour on top of the beam? Concrete, right? Okay. It's not necessarily just right on top of the beam. If we looked at the beam going out in both directions, um, there could be Forming, oftentimes they use these things called pre-manufactured metal deck forms. Okay, it looks something like this. Okay, and like this. And in buildings, it's common to use lightweight concrete on top of that. It's better for fire protection. It's also lighter and keeps your loads down. It's also easier to pump. Okay, lots of things like that. So th these are the forms. And they don't have to use metal forms. These are really, really thin, extremely thin, like a sixteenth of an inch thin. And these are extremely dangerous. Okay, if you're ever on the job site and you see one that's not the reason, the only reason it has any strength and stiffness at all is because of its shape. Okay, if you've seen one that's damaged, run. Okay, fast. Don't go near it because when you step, you will go right through. Okay. The other thing that's scary is with a hammer, okay, a decent sized hammer, if it's dropped from not even very far, it will go right through it. So oh, who cares? Well, if you're standing even somewhat near it, not so good. Okay? So pre manufactured, take it from me, I've seen it happen myself. Okay. They're not safe. Okay? Gotta watch out for them. Now, it's common instead of using the, the metal deck forms, you can use wood forming. But oh my gosh, that's expensive and hard to deal with, and I don't like that either. Okay. So, in the bridge world, what they've done, at least in the state of Texas, 
um, not in the state of Oklahoma, but in the state of Texas, is they use things called, um, they use precast panels. So you, they'll use thin precast, three inch to four inch thick precast panels that they'll actually use to stay in place forms. Okay. So they'll pick these up, place these on top of the girders, They'll pour the concrete in there, and they only—they're only pouring something like a couple inches of concrete on top. Okay, this is, I think, a better system, much better system, um, but it hasn't caught on yet. Here, it's used in Kansas, Missouri, Illinois, Texas, a couple places on the East Coast and West Coast, but not commonly used in the state of Oklahoma. Okay, great. So why do we care about this? Shored versus unshored. We're structural engineers. <laughs> why do we need to know about this? Cost? Yeah, there's more reasons. But yeah, cost. What else? Deformation. What's that? Deformation. Deformation of what well, what's different between short and unshored? Unsure, you'll get immediate deflection due to the pour. That's exactly right. Okay, and short, you don't. Um, <clears throat> I, I drew a picture last time, and I, I hope it makes sense to everybody the way the way it, it looks and, and is. I bring my little cheat sheet. No, I didn't. So hopefully, I get it. Yeah, I'm not here. I did. And hopefully I get it right. If we talk about live load deflection, well, we had one that went up like this and over, and we had one that had an immediate deflection, immediate amount of deflection, and it had the same amount of stiffness, and they ended up going to the same spot. Right? They had different yields. One had a lower yield than the other one. They all, both ended up having the same strength. Both ended up having the same stiffness, at least for for live load. Which one's which? Unshored's on the bottom. That's right. This is the unshored. The top one's the shorter. So I'm a big fan of graphs. Okay. This is an important graph. Really sums up very, very succinctly with the differences between unshored and short construction, especially with the showing these stiffnesses being the same and showing that the yields are different, yet the ultimate strengths are the same. Make sense? Great. How much slab um, can we take into account in composite construction? Can we use the whole width of the slab? Hmm. What, are we, what am I talking about? If I draw a plan view, I have several beams. On top of those beams, I cast a slab. How much tributary area can I get out of this beam? How much tributary slab width can I get out? What's that? Be yeah, it has to be effective. And how do you figure out what be effective is? What are the numbers? Three be, of them. Could be different on each side. Could be different on each side. Uh, one eighth the beam span. One eighth the span. Half the spacing, right? What's the root? And then the cantilever distance, right? Tip to the cantilever. But from center line to cantilever. We're going to do these numbers for this side and for this side, right? To figure out what kind of tri tributary width we're going to end up with. 
So when it comes to these systems, what are the two categories of failures? There's two big things that can happen. I didn't really call them categories, but there's two. I kind of grouped everything in the two different ways things can go down. And it had to do with the plastic neutral axis. What, what was it? Plastic neutral axis in the slab. Plastic neutral axis in the slab? And the other one the plastic neutral axis is in the girder. The girder. Which one would we prefer from a ductility point of view? The one in the slab. One in the slab. How come? a lot less strain in the concrete at failure is what probably the simplest way to, to talk about it and think about it. Um, if we're to draw a typical cross section with slab, beam, our neutral axis happens to be in the slab when we go to draw our strains. The further this point moves down, the more and more demand we're going to put on our, on our concrete and compression, right? Hey, I got a question for you. What if I have uplift, or what if I have negative moment on a situation like this? Say I have a composite structure, composite structure, and now I have negative moment on it. So the negative moment means the top's going to be in what? Tension. And the bottom is going to be in what? Compression. How do I design that? <clears throat> could. But if you go and look, um, you could. You could do that. But uh, if you go and look, we, we often ignore that amount of steel up there because it's so low. So how do you handle a situation like this? What do you usually assume about the concrete? It cracks, right? Okay, if it cracks, is it there? Yeah. No. It's not there, and the only thing you can count on is the steel up there. If you want to. If you've got plenty of time on your hands, go for it. It'll change your answer by about five, three to 5%. I have done the math. My question, though, is how do you design the situation. But you would act like there is no steel deck, there is no deck on top. Can you still rely on the dead weight from the slab? Yeah, but for what? Just to hold you down? Yeah, just counterbalance the Yeah, but dead weight, you know, you're going to find in your life, dead weight's, it's rare when it helps you, man. It's, it's I'm not saying it won't ever save you, but pretty much ignore it. Oftentimes, it, because of failure, we're talking about really high loads, right? Extremely high loads. Not always, though. So, it's coming, okay? I don't know if it'll be on a test or on a homework, but, you know, at some point, you got to make sure you're not a robot and you understand what it is you're actually designing, okay? So if this situation arises where you have tension on the top and compression on the bottom, you're going to assume that this, is, this isn't there and you're going to work it just like it's a normal, it's a normal beam. When is that going to happen? I don't know. Homework or an exam? I don't know. When, when in, case, in real happen, life, would that happen? Ah, easy. Continuous girder. Let's say it's composite. Well, let's say I have load over it, okay? So I start to draw what the deflected shape is going to look like, right? The moment diagram is going to be the opposite of the deflected shape. So it's going to be positive, negative,
any place where I have negative moment. Right? Any place where I have negative moment. Simply supported beams, you don't have to think about it unless the wind blows up. Anything else? Okay, let's keep going. Yeah! Halloween! Yeah! Spooky. Last time, we were talking about composite beam design. And we got down into this. We got two situations. Okay? We had the plastic neutral axis in the deck, plastic neutral axis in the girder. Can we still find a capacity for the plastic neutral axis in the girder? Yes, we can, and we will. Okay? Just because it's not ideal doesn't mean that it can't be done. Okay? Okay. Now, one thing I, you need to do to your notes. Every single time you see a 0.85, remember what that value is really? Beta 1. Not every time, but on these three. That's beta 1. Down here. Now that's not beta 1. That is not. That's just 0.85. This is beta 1. This is beta 1. I need to change that in my notes, and it, I will next time. Does anyone know what happens to your fee factor when you go into compression controlled failure for reinforced concrete beams? What do you remember? It changes, doesn't it? It goes down. It does go down to 0.65. Not in steel. Probably should. Okay? And if you do some calcs to show that the strains in the concrete are being exceeded, that the crushing strains are being exceeded, then I would highly recommend that it is on your shoulders, even though the code doesn't tell you to, to drop this to 0.65. Okay? But that's not what the code says. Composite girders are kind of a funny business. They kind of fall in the middle between steel and concrete. Steel people all say it's it's a concrete issue. All the concrete people say it's a steel issue. And doesn't eat, get covered well by anybody, but it's a very, very widely used, very widely used construction technique. So you need to understand what's going on. All right. Cool. Now, this is the neat thing. This is this is the point where you like wake up out of your candy and candy infused coma. Okay, to to pay attention. This is this is the secret to these. You make this comparison. ASFY to beta 1 F prime C T sub S B effective. Okay? And if it's lower, it means that plastic neutral axis is in your deck. If it's higher, it means your plastic neutral axis is in the girder. What are we doing here? We are basically drawing a line in the sand in between these two. We're plastifying everything above. We're plastifying everything below. And we're comparing them. If they equal one another, that means that's the plastic neutral axis. Okay? If the girder is higher, that means we've got to move it up into the deck. If the deck is stronger, that means we've got to move it down into the girder. You with me? It's the same thing you're supposed to do on your homeworks that no one's looked at because we have a test on Friday. Right? Okay? Except for Brady. He's done. But anyway. <coughs> That's what it comes down to. You with me? Okay. This is awesome. This is neat. This is simple. And if you're in this one, you use these equations to find the moment capacity. If you're in this one, you actually have to find the plastic neutral axis, which you know how to do, because you, you're doing it on a homework. That's the point where the loads balance, right? Find where the points where the loads balance. 
And then you have to sum everything above and sum everything below. Well, not sum, you have to sum the moments. Multiply by the moment arm by to the distance to the plasma neutral axis, each one of these. Basically, sum the moments about the plasma neutral axis to find MCP. Just like you did on your homework, or going to do on your homework. Okay? Awesome. That's cool. Somebody asked me about shear studs. I think it was David. Shear stud design. Studs will fail by one of the following situations. You'll either have concrete failure, okay, or you'll have fracture of the stud. Okay? When it comes to concrete failure, what's really going on here is you get some localized crushing and crushing and you get like a if anyone's had me for advanced reinforced concrete, this is a bottleneck strut that forms okay, and splits. Okay, localized splitting failure. Okay, if you haven't, don't worry. You just use this equation. Okay? You just use this equation. 0.5 times the area of the stud, which is pi over 4 times stud diameter squared, times the square root of F prime C, E sub C. For E sub C, I recommend 57,000 root F prime C. Okay? Okay. Or, we got our stud failure, which is 0.6 times the area of the stud times FU, which is 60 KSI for Nelson studs. Okay? 60 KSI for Nelson studs. 0.6 times the area of the stud times FU. Now there are some talk that this needs to change. There's some talk that why are we allowing them to go so high and so strong? Okay, this needs to be changed. Especially if we're going to go to this uh, partial composite design. Okay, but as far as I know it has not changed in the 14th edition of the code still in there is this. Alright? Because realize, I mean, we're, we're allowing the true fracture capacity here. Okay? No fee factors involved. I mean, you're let, letting it get up there and go. Okay? Now, the maximum stud spacing is 8 times the slab thickness. The maximum stud diameter is two and a half times the top flange thickness. Okay? But almost always people use, I believe they're three quarter inch Nelson studs. That's just what they use. That's all there is. Okay? I think it's three quarter inch. There's like one size of Nelson studs. People have talked about going to bigger ones, but I think they only make one size right now. Well, that stud always fractured for that well fails. No. Well, take that back. By design, yes. The weld, I'm sorry, the stud should fracture before the weld does, by design. But it doesn't always work out that way because you get imperfections in your welds. You can't really inspect. It's like I said, it's like 10. 10 to 10 percent or so that you knock down or you know that you're supposed to knock over or look at. Sometimes they'll visually inspect them. They'll have like a little mirror <laughs> that they'll hold down there and they'll try to go and look and make sure they got flash, they call it all the way around. Make sure they can see well all the way around. They still don't know if there's any holes inside there or not. They have no clue. So, you know, usually works pretty well. Okay, the number of studs needed is determined by the load in the concrete deck divided by the capacity of the studs. I'm going to say that again. Some of the people forget sometimes. The number of studs needed is determined by the load in the concrete deck. So if we think about this for a second, if we think about this stud, all this stud has to withstand is that load. It's what it does. When we go and we solve these situations, we can figure out how much load is in the concrete deck. 
Is it the entire deck is plastified? Okay, or a portion of the deck is plastified? Pardon me, a portion of the deck is plastified? Or the entire deck is plastified? You're never going to have to design for more than that. Because that's the load transfer, right? That's how much load has to be transferred. Okay. Oh yeah, one more thing. So, um, so if we talk about this situation for the plastic neutral axis is in the slab, your the easiest way to calc calculate is AS times FY. Why? Because the plastic neutral axis is in the slab. That means the entire girder is plastified. You could calculate this if one wanted to this value up here, but you know it has to be equal to ASF, AS times FY. It has to be. They have to be equal to one another. They have to balance out. If not, they're flying in outer space. Okay? The amount of load is AS times FY. How so much load is there? In this situation, it's going to be 0.85 times F prime C times T sub S times B effective. Hey, that's what I got. Yay. Now here's another one. I say it's, this is the number of studs for half the span length. What? Why is it only half the span length? Yeah. Remember when we have our system... We have some kind of load on it, and we get a shear diagram, and we get a moment diagram, which may look something like that. We have to provide enough capacity for the compressive forces here to get out, and the compressive forces here to transfer. So we have to provide that many studs on this side and then again that same number on that side. This is really important. You will kill people if you get this wrong because you'll be off by a factor of two. When you calculate these numbers you're only doing it for half the span length and that's actually not exactly right. It's half the span if it's a simple supported girder. It's really the distance between the maximum moment and zero moment where you have to provide those studs over in the maximum moment and the zero moment. Because that's where that compression force has to be transferred over. Just so happens in a simple supported beam, at least with, with symmetric loading, that that's for half the span. So that maybe needs to be from max moment, max positive moment to zero moment. On each side. So if for some reason our load's not in the center, well you're gonna have to jam in a bunch of studs here. And here you could space them out further if you wanted to. No one builds anything that way. Okay? They pick one spacing that controls and they go, well, typically. Okay, I have seen it before where they'll have higher concentrations at the ends and lower concentrations um, in the middle. Okay, but I'm not a big fan of that because I think people make mistakes when you do that. Any questions? Okay, so let's do our summary of composite beams. This kind of summarizes everything that we've been talking about here. Before we jump into some problems, I'm going to try to get to these problems fast. So. Let's do this fast. So we're gonna, this is a table. We're gonna put in one if the answer is most, two if it's in the middle, and three if it's least, something like that. So if we're gonna talk about slip, and I like a full composite, partial composite, non-composite, which one's got the most slip? None, most. Which one's got the least? Full. This one's the middle. Ultimate strength. What's that? 
Full deposit? Yeah, that's right. Most least middle stiffness. We're talking about live load deflection now. That's cool. Let's talk about construction type, short versus unshort. Deflection from dead load. Which one? Which one's got the highest deflection from dead load? Unsure. Unsure. Deflection from live load. What if we say stiffness? Stiffness from live load. Resistance to deflection from live load. They're equal, aren't they? Ultimate strength. Same. Yielding. Which one's going to yield first? What's that? Unsure. First. Last. Okay, just good to have all this in our heads, to understand what's going on. So if we're doing a calc, a design calc, does it make any difference if it's short or unsure? No, it doesn't. At least for ultimate strength. How about for live load deflection? Does it make any difference? No. Doesn't make any difference at all. So when does it make a difference? Well, when you go and you pour that concrete or whatever on top, you want to make sure that your deflection is not too excessive, right? Because you're increasing dead load. It's costing more concrete. Okay? Lots of other issues. Okay? Okay. Yay! Time for math. Now, I don't have time to go through every single number here, but I'm gonna. Well, well, I think it's it's worth our time to go through some at least give commentary over these problems. Okay, and I'm, you're gonna need to fill in the blanks yourself. All right, and I'm gonna work these problems three different ways. <laughs> First, I'm just going to show you um, the calcs, okay? Just how you calculate something. So if I'm, I'm given a structure, this is 40 foot in this direction, um, this beam, I, I want to design this beam in the center, okay? There's four at 10 feet, so 40 feet, it's 10 foot, 10 foot, 10 foot, 10 foot, okay? I'm giving you the dead load, I'm giving you the live load. Um, Concrete's 3,000 KSI, find my east of C, 3122, 3 quarter inch diameter studs, FU is 65 KSI, gotta find my B, effective, B, B, effective. That's about 12 feet, I'm sorry, 10 feet, which is 120 inches. That's cool. I look up some sizes for my girder, my A, my Z, and my D. Find my stud capacity. Basically plug into the numbers. I get uh, 21.4 kips for one of them, 15.9 kips for the other. I'm basically just doing check one and check two. I'm going to pick the lower one, right? This one controlled. Second check controlled for the stud. 
15.9 kips. Okay, so now I get to find M sub P. So what do I, what do I need to check first? Where's my plastic neutral axis? Good answer, class. Where's my plastic neutral axis? And how do I do that? Oh, I plastify everything above the girder, I plastify everything below the girder, and I see what, they, what, that, what happens. Basically, I solve for ASFY, I get 810. I solve for 0.85 F prime C, all this mumbo jumbo, I get 1377. Because 810 is less than 1377, that means I have to move my neutral axis up. Please realize what I just did. Plastified everything above, I plastified everything below, whoop, above and below. Find I find out that I need to move this up. I need to move this up. You with me? So that's what I did. Plastic neutral axis is in the slab, it moved up. I solved for my A, it was 2.65 inches. Plug into my phi M sub P number. This is just the equation we had on the previous page with numbers that you can look up on your own. Okay, it's 0.85 is my phi factor. This is ASFY. This is D over 2 and A over 2, and this is the thickness of the slab. Get 858 kit feet. My required capacity, I go ahead and do my factor my loads, my 1.2 and my 1.6, and I get 600 kit feet. Everybody with me? Oh, I'm good. 858 is greater than 600. Very cool. Now I got to design the number of studs. Remember, this is the number of studs between the center and the end. Okay, I'm assuming, I guess, my moment's constant throughout. Okay, I guess. 810 is the load that's in the slab. 810 divided by 15.9, would that come from? Well, that was the capacity of a stud. I found out that I need 50.9 or 51 studs between the center and the end. Now, usually you can put two studs across. You'd have to look at your girder and see if you have the space to do that. You can see three sometimes across from one another. Okay, I've even seen staggered studs like that, and I've also seen it where we got two and oh, uh, can't remember how else they did it. Anyway, all kinds of tricks to get studs in there. Okay, all kinds of tricks. Fifty-one studs between the middle and the end, between where the maximum moment is and the end. The details aren't really given, so we'll assume it's between the middle and the end. And we will pick up right here next time, and we are going to have more than you. We are going to hit this.